Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Lachlan, and on behalf of the FOFC Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania and our friends at GenDX, I wanted to welcome you to our advanced in epilepsy genetic testing, exploring the clinical utility of genomic sequencing webinar. Tonight we have Katie Frittinger, who will be speaking with us about genetic testing that can make a difference in our lives of epilepsy patients and their families. Katie attended Wittenberg University where she obtained a Bachelor of Arts in Biology with a minor of Chemistry and Psychology in 24. Uh, she attended the University of North Carolina at Greensboro Genetic Counseling Program and graduated with her genetic counseling master's degree in 2006. And from 2006 to 2012, she was employed with Integrated Genetics at Senior Genetic Counseling in Miami, uh, in Florida. She worked as a prenatal genetic counselor in a maternity fetal medicine specialty clinic. And in uh, 2012, Katie moved to Columbus, Ohio and joined the GenDX sales and marketing team as neurology product specialist in 2014. She became the senior genetic testing specialist providing support to all GenDX testing options. Katie joined Patient-Centered Health Intelligence Committee, or company, I'm sorry, Semaphore, and in 2019 as medical science liaison for the Women's Health Division. After the merger of Sema D, or Seven Four, I'm sorry, and Gene DX, in 2022, Katie transitioned to Gene DX team as medical science liaison, supporting the Gene DX genomic testing portfolio. So um, if you have questions throughout the evening, please put them in chat post them in chat, and I will present them to Katie at the end of the program. So welcome, Katie, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to uh, join this evening and speak with your group about genomic testing. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and get things started. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, again, I'm Katie Frittinger. I work as a medical science liaison with GeneDX. Um, I'm trained certified genetic counselor and tonight we're going to be talking about advances in epilepsy genetic testing. We're exploring the clinical utility of genomic sequencing. So that's quite a, a mouthful, um, but really the agenda is to focus on um, kind of genetic testing fundamentals almost like a little genetics 101, just to get you some um, basic terminology and understanding um, of some key concepts of genetic testing. We'll explore the benefits of te genetic testing for epilepsy, as well as the advances, and then talking about making genomic sequencing accessible. Uh, we'll end with a Q&A, so I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I'll also provide my contact information if you think of things after the presentation. My hope is for you just, again, to have a better understanding after the presentation today of, of, you know, what is genetic testing for epilepsy and how it can be beneficial. I don't expect you to be genetic counselors or geneticists um, or get a PhD in, in genetics by the end of this, but just to really understand a bit more about the testing and uh, feel, a bit, uh, feel a little bit more comfortable about about what this topic is and um, potentially having conversations with your providers if you think would be beneficial for you or your family members. So let's start with genomic sequencing and testing fundamentals. So I'm gonna start with the basics. Again, um, there's no quiz at the end of this. I just wanna get some terminology and some basic understanding that we'll build upon as we, we talk a little bit more about genetic testing. So when we think about genes and genetics, we first think about the cell. So there's billions of cells in our body and within our cells are this, this little membrane structure that contains all of our DNA or all of our genomic, our genes, um, all of the genomic material that we have. Inside the nucleus are these structures called chromosomes. These are long strands of DNA that are tightly wound around proteins. And in each 
cell within that nucleus, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes. So typically uh, you get 23 pairs of chromosomes from um, your mom and 23 from dad. So a total of 46 chromosomes in every cell of our body. If you were to unwind those tightly packed chromosomes, you would start to see DNA and genes. So genes are just the instructions that tell cells how to make proteins. And these proteins perform various functions in the body. Genes also determine many features uh, about an individual, such as your eye color, your hair color, your height, and many other physical uh, features of the body. If you break down genes even smaller, you start to see the DNA. These are the actual hereditary material that make up genes. Um, there are four types of building blocks, A, T, C, and G, and they are arranged in like two long strands that form a spiral around each other called a double helix. Uh, again, no quiz at the end of this, just to give you some basic understanding of kind of genetics 101 here. So I like to think of an analogy when we talk about genetics. So if you had a um, cookbook, a cookbook on how to how to create a human being, all of the recipes, all the chapters, all of the sentences, all the letters of that complete book is actually all of the DNA, okay? So if you look at all the genetic material and you put it into a cookbook, that's the entire book is your DNA. When you open the book and start to look at specific chapters, think of those like the chromosome. So a book would have 46 chapters. Um, and then if you broke it down more, genes are like the individual recipes within a cookbook. So um, that's how I like to think about if you look at DNA as all of our genetic material, there should be 46 chapters or 46 chromosomes in every cell of the body. And then there's many, many, many genes or recipes within those chapters. So let's talk about genes in a bit more detail. Again, genes are the instructions that tell the body how to grow and develop. And each human being has about 20,000 genes. So there's 20,000 genes in every cell of our body. There can be a variety of different changes within a gene. We call those variations. Some variants can cause a gene not to work properly. So a change in the gene um, makes it no longer, or basically the, the change in the gene can no longer make the protein that it's supposed to. Um, so that causes problems in the way the gene functions. Some variants are benign. So there's a change in the gene, but it does not impact the gene's function. So it can do its normal um, work. It can make the proteins that it's supposed to. It's just a normal change that doesn't cause any problem. Some variants within a gene are very common and some are very rare. We all have variants. We all have variations across our genome. Some we know about, some we don't, um, but, and then some cause problems and some don't. So there can be many variations across these 20,000 genes. You may also hear the term mutation sometimes. That's a, a terminology where a change in the gene causes the gene not to work properly. And that mutation affects the ability of the protein to, to work correctly. We're really moving away from the term mutation and replacing it with a term called pathogenic variant. So that's the term I'm going to use moving forward. Um, but just to let you know that um, that's kind of the change in some of the terminology we're, we're moving away from using the word mutation and replacing it with variant. And if that change does not, causes the gene not to work properly, we call that a pathogenic variant. Okay, last slide on talking about what genetics are and the structures of, uh, of genes. So we talked about chromosomes hold all of our genetic material and DNA. And if you kind of unwound that chromosome, you'd see the double helix and there's genes within this um, portion of this double helix. Well, to break down genes a little bit more, there are portions of a gene called an exon 
and portions of a gene called intron. This will be important a little bit later, so that's why I want to mention these terminologies. Exons are sections of the gene that actually make the proteins. Um, the exons make about one to two percent of the human genome. So they are very important and have um, very important work to do in our body. But when you look at all the genetic material, they account for a very small piece of our human genome. But because they have such important functions, we know that most genetic conditions are due to variants within the exons. The other part of a gene is called an intron. These are sections of the gene that are actually removed when proteins are being made. We used to call them junk DNA. We didn't think they really had any purpose. They do account for more of the human genome, about 25% of the human genome. But what we are finding is that sometimes variants in the introns actually cause um, uh, a protein not to work properly and can cause a, a condition or a disease. So obviously we know lots of, about genetics, but we're continuing to learn. So we used to think introns really had no important um, function or important contribution to human disease. And we're learning um, that we were wrong and we're finding uh, that there are variants within these sections of the gene that can cause issues. So let's talk a little bit about genetic testing strategies. There's a variety of different ways you can look for a genetic variant um, to see if there is a variant causing a person's condition or medical problems. Again, there's no quiz at the end of this. I just wanna give you an idea that there's a variety of different tests that a doctor may perform to see um, if there's any changes in a person's genes that can be causing their epilepsy. One common test is called a chromosome microarray, or we call it a CMA for short. This is where we're looking to see if there's any extra or missing pieces of chromosomes. So we say if there's any pieces that are deleted or missing or any pieces of the chromosome that are extra. Remember, an individual should have 46 chromosomes in every cell of their body. So if there's pieces of chromosome missing or pieces of chromosomes that are duplicated, this would cause an imbalance in the number of genes or the amount of DNA an individual has. And that can cause a genetic condition or um, a medical problem like epilepsy. So some tests will look at all of your kind of chromosomes to see if there's pieces of material that are extra or missing. Another type of test we could do is look for a single gene that we know is associated with epilepsy. And doctors may look for a single gene because they may have a high suspicion that this gene is causing a person's epilepsy. Or maybe we already know that there's um, this gene problem in the family. There's a family history, maybe a brother or sister, mom, dad, aunt, uncle has had genetic testing and we know um, what's causing the genetic epilepsy in the family. So they just test for that one gene. And that can, that can be very helpful, but Traditionally, it could be also very time consuming. If you just look at one gene at a time, if that testing, that first test is negative and you wanna look for another gene, if that's negative, it can be very costly and time consuming and not a really great way to check for um, genetic uh, conditions if you have to do it one gene at a time, if there's a condition that could be caused by many different genetic uh, variations. Several years ago, over 10 years ago, testing called multi-gene panel testing came out. This is where you could look for a set of genes all at the same time, um, and it made genetic testing more comprehensive, and you could test for many things in a single test. It was a, a kind of a breakthrough at the time. So you could test for many common uh, genes associated with a condition. 
So for example, we know there are many different genes that can cause a person to have epilepsy. So we may look at a panel of anywhere from a few genes up to a hundred or more um, genes that we know can cause epilepsy all at once. So it's faster to get results because you don't have to go single gene by single gene. You can look for a lot of different genes at once. Um, and it was a, a better approach for, for testing. Then came along a newer test. Um, GeneDX has been offering this test since 2012, something called whole exome sequencing or WES or WES for short. So this is where we analyze all the exons of an individual gene. So if you remember that picture I, I showed before, exons are a part of a gene um, that make proteins. So what this test does is it tests all, hooks up all 20,000 genes, all the little exons of those genes um, to see if there's a change in any of those exons that could be causing epilepsy or whatever condition that you're looking for. So it can test for common genetic changes, it can test for rare, and also any newly discovered genes. And then most recently, a newer test has kind of come about um, called whole genome sequencing. So this is where we're analyzing all the exons and the introns of an individual's genes. Um, so again, looking at all 20,000 genes, but looking at more of the complete gene on both the exons and introns. And it does the same thing. It tests for common, rare, and newly discovered genes. So um, kind of go back to our analogy. If you were thinking about, okay, so you've got all these different tests, what are they looking for? So a whole exome and whole genome sequencing is like if you were looking at the entire cookbook, you're looking at all 20,000 genes in its entirety to see if there's any gene changes causing the epilepsy. That chromosome microarray I talked about, it's looking for any pieces of the chromosome that are extra or missing. So this is looking to see, are there chapters from the book missing? Um, is it a whole chapter missing? Is it a um, half of a chapter missing. So that's kind of what a chromosome microarray is doing. And then a single gene test or a multi-gene panel test is looking for these uh, set of genes, like the individual recipes, to see if there's any changes in, this, um, in the genes that we're looking for that could be causing the epilepsy. Now, this this slide is a lot. I don't expect you to memorize this or um, um, understand it in its completion, but I wanted to kind of give you a visual representation of where testing um, started and where we're going, and that there are benefits and limitations to all different types of genetic testing. Um, and to, to again, kind of give you a visualization. So this side here is all the different types of genetic changes um, that we commonly test for. And so you can see that microarray that's looking for the, the pieces of the chromosomes that are missing or extra. It's really good at detecting these type of genetic changes, but it does not have the ability to test for these other ones. Same with multi-gene panels. It's really good at looking for some types of genetic changes, but it can't test for others. And so what whole exome sequencing as well as whole genome sequencing is able to do, is basically have the advantage of being able to test for many different type of gene changes in one test. Um, compared to the microarray and multi-gene panel testing that we've traditionally had for a longer time. So um, again, it can't do everything, but it's really great at combining um, kind of these two tests that we've had in the past that typically were ordered separately um, and would take time to get results back and um, would be, you know, you'd have to pay to to cost for those tests. Um, so this is, again, whole exome sequencing, the nice thing about it, it's a more complete test um, in one single package. 
So when you do genetic testing, typically there are three different types of results that you can get. One is a positive result or a diagnostic result. That means we found a change in a gene that causes a person's symptoms or their genetic disorder or the cause for their epilepsy. Another type of result is a negative or non-diagnostic. That means with the test that was performed, with the technologies that were used, or the benefits and limitations of that specific technology, um, we did not find a gene change that explains the person's health condition or epilepsy. So the, again, the idea is the more you can test for, um, the more likely you're going to get a positive result or can rule out with a negative result. Another type of result you may get is a variant of uncertain significance or a VUS. That means we found a gene change, but we don't know exactly what it means right now. If you remember before at the very beginning, I talked about some variants we know a lot about um, and we know they cause uh, genetic conditions. And when we see that variant in a gene, we know a lot of information and we can say, yep, that causes a person's um, symptoms. We also know sometimes that variants uh, are completely benign, meaning if we see a change in that gene, we know it does not prevent the gene from working properly. The protein still can be made. So we consider that just a normal variation. And so sometimes we see a variant and it's very rare. We may have never seen it before or only seen it a few times. And based upon the scientific evidence we have at that moment, that the time of the test is run, we don't know if that gene change is going to cause problems or if it's benign. It's kind of like in this gray zone. So we don't know the significance of this gene change. So um, at that time, we just say, we've seen a gene change. We don't know if it's diagnostic or negative. And we need to continue to look at the literature and hopefully we'll have more information about this variant in the future. So typically, especially at Gene Deox, we, we like to look at these variants um, in, you know, over the years. And if we see there is more evidence that this gene is um, changed, if we know it's positive or maybe now we consider it negative, we can update reports in the future if there's more scientific evidence to tell us which way um, that gene variant kind of uh, sways, if it's more of a diagnostic or more benign. But um, that's one limitation of genetic testing is sometimes we just don't know with the information we have, if we see a gene change, if, an, if it's associated with a condition or not. So let's talk about the diagnostic rate of these different testing options I talked about. So when I mean diagnostic rate, that means the chance you will get a positive result or um, something in the test result that diagnostic and we have found the cause for the person's epilepsy or other medical conditions. So I talked about we, we have a variety of different types of testing approaches and um, not all tests are created equal and um, tests are improving over time. And so what we're finding is that there are better diagnostic rates with this exome sequencing compared to a traditional panel or a chromosome microarray that's CMA. So when I talked about those panels of genes where you can test for maybe just a few genes or several hundred genes, about 10% of the time we'll find a genetic change related to the individual's um, epilepsy or medical condition. That diagnostic rate actually is a little bit, uh, it, it improves with chromosomal microarray where you're looking for the, those pieces of chromosomes that are missing or extra. But because exome sequencing combines um, all those different technologies and can look for more types of genetic variants compared to those other types of tests, it actually has a much higher diagnostic yield, up to 53%, um, or up to 53% chance of finding a genetic cause for the patient's condition um, with that test. 
So this has been an exciting thing in the genetics world to see that we have a test that's better. It's more complete. You don't have to do um, several tests to kind of um, get to that same diagnostic yield as exome sequencing. So the point of telling you about all these different tests is that doctors will approach genetic testing very differently. Um, it, it really varies across the United States within hospital systems. So if you've had genetic testing in the past and um, the testing has been negative or um, it's been done many, many years ago, but there's still a high suspicion you may have a genetic cause for your epilepsy, it may be worth having a conversation with your provider to see what testing you've had done in the past. And if there's um, updated or more in informative testing you could do now, or you may have never had genetic testing done in the past. So it may be a good time to have a conversation with your provider about, um, is this an appropriate uh, test for you? Is this something that may be helpful for you um, and your family members? So I want to talk a little bit more about the genetics of epilepsy. So we know that there is a underlying genetic cause in about 40% of individuals with epilepsy. Um, genes have been identified that can cause both generalized seizures and focal seizures, as well as unclassified epilepsy types like um, infantile spasms. Uh, the chance of having a genetic variant is higher for specific epilepsy types, such as an infantile spasm, Dravet syndrome, and other types of epilepsies. The inheritance pattern can be um, very different. And what that means is um, sometimes a condition can be dominant. What that is, is when a an individual has a gene change and every time they have a child, there's a 50% chance they pass on that gene change to their child and they would have the, um, a genetic epilepsy. Some are inherited in autosomal recessive manner. That means there's a gene change in mom and a gene change in dad. And when those genes are passed on to the children, uh, if the children get two genetic variations, it can cause the condition. Some are X-linked, that means they're typically passed through our sex chromosomes, usually from mom to sons. And sometimes genetic changes occur de novo. What de novo means is there are no genetic changes that cause epilepsy in the parents, but there's a brand new gene change that just happens in that um, child. It happens while um, the sperm and egg come together and there's a, a genetic change that happens at that kind of that time of conception in those early um, moments of the cell division. And so it's not passed down from anybody, but there is a brand new gene change that causes the uh, epilepsy or medical condition in that person. Pathogenic variants in a single gene may be associated with many different types of seizures. So some individuals will have the same exact gene change, but have different types of seizures or different type of medical conditions. And vice versa, sometimes variants in very different genes can cause similar medical conditions or the same epilepsy type. So genetics can be confusing. <laughs> That's the kind of the message there is it's not always straightforward. Um, and so we, you know, as clinicians and as labs, really do a lot of research to try to understand um, how these gene changes work and how um, they can, um, how the symptoms are associated with those gene changes. Okay. So why can, why is genetic testing in epilepsy important or beneficial? Why would you even want to kind of consider this type of testing? Well, we know a precise genetic diagnosis can lead to more effective treatments and help identify, treat, and or prevent co-occurring medical conditions for children with epilepsy. So we know up to 80% of cases have implications for treatment and management. Patients with a genetic diagnosis can achieve up to 90% seizure reduction in some cases. 
and that diagnoses can mean improved access to resources and clinical trial eligibility. The other thing we see is that looking at individuals who do have a genetic underlying cause for their epilepsy, that their path to a genetic diagnosis can be long, it can be windy, and it can be costly. So we, um, looking at the literature, know that um, individuals with genetic diagnosis um, or di underlying genetic causes for their uh, epilepsy or other medical conditions can accrue over $10,000 in additional healthcare costs. They can wait over six years on average for a genetic diagnosis and undergo more than five uninformative tests. So tests that didn't give them any information and were not helpful in their clinical care. And what we're, you know, we're trying to do is find a precise diagnosis with our comprehensive testing so patients can get to a definitive diagnosis faster. Um, we call this kind of um, journey to um, finding the cause for someone's epilepsy or um, genetic condition, a diagnostic odyssey. And by doing genetic testing earlier and more comprehensive, we can reduce that testing strategy and that diagnostic odyssey by six to eight years. And we know there are many benefits to genetic testing. Um, some here, you know, I've laid out here, this is um, not comprehensive and we can really talk about the benefits at an at a even deeper level, but high level, you know, we, what I was just saying, we, we can identify a diagnosis faster um, and can end that patient's diagnostic odyssey the earlier we do testing um, and the more comprehensive the genetic testing performed. If we're able to get a genetic diagnosis or even if the testing comes back negative, we can develop a more precise care plan based on that patient's genetic results, um, which can maximize the individual's positive health outcomes as well as alert providers to any additional health concerns that warrant screening. So maybe we do genetic testing and we find a, a gene change that we know causes epilepsy, but we also know that gene change may cause other medical conditions that we may want to start screening for and we're not aware of previously. Um, and so having that information can help us tailored treatment and maybe as well avoid unnecessary um, testing and appointments because we have a more precise diagnosis. You also can connect with parents and other family members um, to get more specific support if there is a genetic cause for um, the epilepsy um, and can get that kind of um, individual connection with other family members who are um, family members and and individuals who have a similar genetic diagnosis in their family. And we know it can increase patient and caregiver satisfaction, as well as qualify patients for treatment options and or clinical trials based upon the findings of those genetic results. Here I have listed um, the impact of genetic testing results on therapeutic decision-making. What this chart is showing is that based upon um, different genes, so this is the name of the gene and the name of the disorder, there are specific treatment implications that are recommended um, and that can help control seizures based upon the, genet the gene that's been involved. So for example, um, this gene here, um, we know that the seizures respond to treatment with vitamin six and folic acid. Um, pole G, we know that this, if a patient has a change in this gene, they really need to avoid valproic acid because it can induce or accelerate liver disease. Um, these conditions, if there's a change in this gene or this gene, there's specific um, medications that should be given. There's specific medications that should be avoided. Um, GLUT1 deficiency responds very well to ketogenic diet. 
So the point of this slide, again, is to understand that there can be specific tailored treatment um, for some of the gene changes that we, we know about to can help that help control um, uh, seizure onset frequency. Um, and so knowing those gene changes can really tailor treatment. So we talked about some of the benefits involved with genetic testing. And we know there's different types of di uh, different genetic tests out there that a doctor can perform. So the literature is kind of coming together or the, the different societies and are really saying one genetic testing should be considered for most individuals who have an unexplained epilepsy. Um, and the guidelines and these different societies are coming out saying whole exome sequencing really should be considered the first test you do because it is more complete and has a higher diagnostic yield or a higher chance of finding a diagnosis. And so, um, you know, the, for patients with developmental delay, intellectual disability, congenital anomalies, epilepsy, or autism, those are the types of patients really should be getting this whole exome sequencing test first. Um, because uh, tests that we used to do first, like the chromosome microarray or these panel options, really don't give you the same um, chance of finding a diagnosis. So the last couple of years, we, we've seen this trend for this type of test to really be considered the first test you go to if you're going to do genetic testing. The American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, or we say ACMG for short, um, they're kind of like the governing body for geneticists and laboratories like us that do genetic testing look to, um, to help understand what type of testing is best for patients. And in 2021, they came out with a statement saying um, patients with developmental delay, intellectual disability, congenital anomalies, neurodevelopmental disabilities, um, including epilepsy, really should be uh, having this exome sequencing testing as a first type tier test. Uh, last fall, uh, the National Society of Genetic Counselors recommended exome sequencing as a first line test for unexplained epilepsy. And the American Epilepsy Society endorsed that statement that was set out by the National Society of Genetic Counselors. So um, let's talk a little bit more about this testing. Um, so at, at GDX, um, We've been doing whole exome sequencing. Again, that's the test that looks at the exons of all 20,000 genes. Um, it's got, that's the test with the highest diagnostic yield. Um, we've been doing this since 2012. Um, and we have done over 400,000 clinical whole exome sequencing. Um, so our database is very, very big. Um, I, I really venture to say it's the biggest um, for any commercial laboratory and probably um, bigger than, uh, um, than most research laboratories. Uh, and because we have been doing this task for so long, have um, such a big database, um, it really helps when you order this test to work with a laboratory that has a type of experience um, because it, it enables a greater diagnostic accuracy even in very complex cases, because um, we've had the experience to look at these different gene changes um, and look at if there's other patients we've seen before with similar gene changes or similar clinical features to help with our analysis. Um, we can do this testing on uh, a blood sample, a buckle, which is like a cheek swab, or and even blood spots. It takes about six to eight weeks to get these results back, um, which is just phenomenal because when this test first started, it would take months and months and months. So um, six to eight weeks is a, is a wonderful turnaround time to get such a complete analysis of this type of um, genetic review and um, of all 20,000 genes. One of the, the big things about when we when you do a test that includes this many genes is we like to have the um, mother and father of the patient or maybe other family members to participate in testing 
because it can greatly increase the chance of um, finding something genetic plus the di diagnostic yield and decreases the time to get a complete answer. So let me let me uh, kind of talk through that. So most genetic in the testing, like the chromosome microarray and the panel testing, we would just get a sample on the patient first. So the proband or the patient would get their sample collected and submit it to the laboratory. The laboratory would do their analysis and do their interpretation and report the results. Um, the results would come to the provider, um, maybe the, the provider is reviewing the results with the patient, maybe a genetic counselor. And if there was any confusion about the results or if you got a variant of unknown significance, um, sometimes we'd have to test the parent to help understand if that variant is um, pathogenic or benign, or sometimes even if you got a positive result, you'd like to know if that gene change is coming from mom or dad to understand how this is being passed down in the family. So once you got the results, then you had to get testing on parents, the process would start over. And so finally, once we got parents results in, we had a more complete picture of um, the genetic testing results. If this is being coming, is this passed down from mom and dad? Uh, is this something that's inherited or brand new? And what's the chance for this to happen? Um, and other family members. Where with whole exome sequencing, we actually like to include the patient and the mom and dad if they're available, or maybe another family member um, to help with analysis. So we call it a trio. Typically, we like to see, you know, the mom, you know, uh, patient, mom, and dad. So that's where the trio comes from. And so you're doing that analysis, the interpretation, their report, and the results all together. So it speeds up the testing and you get a more complete answer in a much faster time. So as I said, um, having parents participate in whole exome sequencing as well as whole genome sequencing really reduces the burden of that VUS. So getting those variants of unknown significance and then having to do follow-up testing. If we have the samples of mom and dad right from the beginning um, or other close relatives, that really lets the laboratory kind of look at the analysis and know, hey, is, is, this, is this variant coming from mom or dad and help us understand if it's, if it's something contributing to um, the patient's epilepsy. So long story is with whole exome and whole genome, if you have parents, it actually reduces the chance of getting a variant of unknown significance. So it reduces the chance of getting a kind of incomplete answer and also increases the chance of getting a diagnostic or positive result because we're able to include the parents' genetics in all of the analysis and it helps our laboratory um, do the analysis in a more complete fashion and it reduces the need for follow-up testing. So it, something that is, is different with whole exome sequencing, the other types of testing is the encouragement to include parents with the testing because of the benefits of lowering those um, potential uh, incomplete results and increasing the chance of finding a, a diagnostic result. The other unique thing about whole exome sequencing as well as whole genome sequencing, you can actually reanalyze the data in the future if the test is um, negative or we do not find an answer with that first test. So with whole exome sequencing, um, most laboratories will offer, well, I can't speak for all laboratories, we'll say GeneDX does and many laboratories do offer the option to look at the data in the future to see if there's any changes um, that we are able to identify. So we typically recommend re-looking at the data months or years after the initial report. And we can look at the data again in the future in, and, and see if there's anything that's changed in the literature, like maybe there's new genes that have been discovered that can cause epilepsy. Um, 
and there's things that we didn't know about with the time of testing, as far as uh, what we know about genetics, or maybe in the future, the patient's medical condition changes, um, and there's new um, symptoms or problems occurring that may be important when we review the, the genetic data. So what we can do is look at this data again in the future if the patient's medical conditions have changed or if um, there's new literature about epilepsy and the genes involved. And we can look at the data with a kind of fresh set of eyes to see if we're able to find any new insights or, um, or things that we think could be contributing to a patient's epilepsy. When we relook at the data in the future, about 29% of the time, we will find more information. Um, so maybe now we have a definitive answer or something that's possibly related um, to the patient's epilepsy. And things that can lead to a, a, a new result or um, a new definitive, kind of a new positive is if, again, there's more clinical information on the patient, if we have found do genes related to epilepsy that we didn't know about at the time of testing, and then just improvements to how we do our analysis. So re-looking at the data is something unique to whole exome and whole genome testing with a chromosome microarray or a, a multi-gene panel. Um, there's not an option to go back and re-look at the data. It's kind of once that test is done, it's done um, because you're looking at a definitive list of genes. Um, and we, we, we typically don't go back and look at the data for any new changes that could be changing those results. So the advantage with whole exome or genome is you do have those options. So in, the in those cases where you do do the testing and it's um, not diagnostic the first time, there's the option to look at data in the future to see if anything's changed and we're able to get more information from that result. I also wanna just briefly touch on the ability to do um, whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing in a rapid fashion. So as I mentioned, um, whole exome typically takes about six weeks, six to eight weeks to get back. Um, and whole genome sequencing is a bit faster, about four weeks to get back. But we do know there are times when we need to test faster. Um, so typically, we, we can do a, what we call a rapid genetic test, a rapid uh, whole exome or genome for patients who are in the hospital and need a test um, in a very fast manner. So we can typically do these tests. It's the same kind of um, deep analysis and um, doesn't cut any corners. We're just able to prioritize the sample and get a preliminary verbal result uh, within five to seven days, and then the full written report in about 10 to 14 days. So again, these are for cases where a patient's in the hospital um, and that they're critically ill or may have a condition in which we need a um, genetic test done fast to see if there's an underlying cause or why they're having that medical condition or issues to see if we can um, implement treatments, tailor medication, do any specific um, you know, tailored intervention based upon those genetic results. So typically these are done in like the NICU, um, the neonatal intensive care unit or uh, the PICU, the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, um, for kids uh, who have hypotonia, seizures, um, birth defects, or complex medical um, condition going on. Um, but this may be also available to um, children who are admitted to the hospital and other, like maybe a neurology floor, an epilepsy floor, who have uncontrolled seizures or are rapidly declining in which we feel like a genetic test could potentially help that patient and it needs to be done in that faster turnaround time. Um, instead of weeks, we can get it back in, um, in days. So, sounds great, right? Everybody should be getting this test in some sense, or uh, uh, I'm just joking. Um, this test has a lot of benefits in many ways, but how can we access it? Um, how do we 
uh, make sure that patients who need to get this testing can actually afford it and, and get the testing if they desire so, and your provider feels it's appropriate for you to have this type of testing. So we know whole exome sequencing is covered in about 70% of commercial plans actually have medical criteria laid out um, that will cover whole exome sequencing. Um, they're always going to vary among each healthcare um, or each health insurer. And we really encourage providers and patients to kind of understand their insurance plan and the medical policy. Um, and that patients really need to meet the specific uh, condition clinical criteria for whole exome um, stated in the medical policy. We do see epilepsy routinely part of medical policy um, when they do have specific criteria for whole exome sequencing um, laid out that epilepsy is typically one of the conditions that is covered if that specific health insurer has um, coverage written in for whole exome. And, and honestly, for some health benefits um, and some insurance plans, there's better insurance coverage for whole exome compared to gene panels, which was really kind of considered, um, you know, more of the go-to testing in the past. So um, we're seeing whole exome kind of have better coverage than um, traditional forms of genetic testing. So, um, when, when a health insurance plan does provide coverage for a whole exome, they tend to have common medical policy requirements. It's like having specific medical conditions. Um, providers typically have to do a completion of a prior authorization um, that can be done by the provider, but also um, sometimes providers will work with a third party pre-authorization service that will facilitate it on their behalf. Um, some health plans may have a specific form that needs to be completed when this testing is performed. Um, and usually the doctors will need to, to document or providers or in the test um, that they are a specialist that understand kind of what genetic testing is and feel comfortable talking with patients about the pros and cons of testing and review what is being done. Um, so medical policies will usually call out like a medical geneticist, a neonatologist, neurologist, um, developmental pediatrician, or other care physician who has expertise or specialty in ordering whole exome. And then usually doctors will need to provide some kind of medical necessity as part of their clinic notes um, that go to the insurance plan to under, so the insurances know that there is um, a medical necessity or reason that the provider is ordering this test. Um, so things like, why is this test being ordered? Um, it, you know, will it have impact on the patient's medication? Um, or their specific um, treatment plan. Um, so these are things that doctors are very used to having to kind of um, provide when ordering genetic testing. The nice thing at GeneDX is we, we do have a whole set of services to kind of help with this process. So if a provider is ordering a whole exome sequencing through our laboratory, we have a lot of services on this end to help providers provide the correct documentation, um, get the prior authorizations and order the testing to ensure that we can get the best coverage as possible. We're also seeing a movement in Medicaid coverage for testing. Um, so we're seeing more and more Medicaid, um, state Medicaid's covering um, whole exome and whole genome sequencing. Um, my presentation focused a lot on whole exome and not as much as on whole genome. Uh, a couple reasons for that. We're seeing much better insurance coverage uh, for whole exome versus whole genome at this time. Um, so we're just seeing many more providers order that testing kind of on the outpatient setting. But the good thing is we're seeing more insurances plans um, providing coverage for that whole genome sequencing. So if that continues to occur, that will be a more accessible test for individuals. Um, right now, um, there are just a few insurance plans that will cover whole genome sequencing. And we're really seeing whole genome sequencing being more 
utilized in those rapid um, scenarios that I talked about where we need to test very fast. Um, and that, that is typically billed to the hospital because the patient's in the hospital and it's not billed directly to the patient's insurance from our point of view. Don't want to get in the weeds about insurance in that point, but that's kind of um, the uh, where we're going as far as medical coverage for testing. And as well, whole genome sequencing has been available at a laboratory for many years. And um, it's really moving out of like the research setting and more into the clinical setting. Um, we're just not seeing it as adopted as much as whole exome sequencing because of um, insurance coverage. I assume that's going to change as we move. Um, and so we'll be seeing the ability to do whole genome sequencing more. Um, but, uh, but the good thing is we're seeing such great uh, coverage of whole exome at this time that it's becoming uh, a more accessible test. The last slide here, hung through with me through this whole um, uh, genetics uh, information. Just want to reiterate that um, you know, GeneDx provides many different services through this process if a um, provider chose to work with our laboratory. So we, we have a lot of services both for the provider but as well as the patient. And one of the things I like to highlight because I'm a genetic counselor, maybe I'm biased, is our genetic counseling support services. So, you know, this testing can be complicated and sometimes can be confusing. So we don't want patients and or providers to ever feel like um, they're on their own when ordering this testing. So we have a, a, a wealth of support on the genetic counseling side. So over a hundred in genetic counselors who can sp support both the providers. So if they have questions about our testing, um, what tests to select, the information they need to provide on the test order, um, when they get a result back, what does it mean? What kind of follow-up testing do I need to do? We have all that type of service for the providers, but more importantly, we have it for patients and families too. As we know that everyone has access to genetic counselors um, at, the, at their um, hospital system. Um, we do encourage if there's local genetic counselors to work with those genetic counselors if you have questions about your results or what testing might be best for your, your specific situation. Um, but if you need additional support or you don't have access to genetic counselors, we do have um, genetic counselors at our laboratory that are patient support genetic counselors that can talk with you through your results um, before the test is done, after the test is done, um, to provide a level of comfort for, um, for you and your family members going through the testing. So that's my last slide. I really thank you for your time this evening. Um, as I said, there was no quiz at the end. I just wanted to kind of give a high level of the different types of genetic tests that are out there, um, the evolution of testing, um, and to encourage you to talk with your providers if it's something you're interested in, if you've had testing done in the past and you want to make sure there's nothing that um, is newer or you could be done um, since you've had testing, just to let you know, uh, genetics is always advancing. And what I say today will probably be very different um, in a year from today. Uh, but we're, we're here to help kind of support you in that journey of understanding genetics and how they're, how they can play an important role in epilepsy care. So Mary, I'm done. If there's questions, I know we're probably right at time. I, I tend to talk a lot, so I'm sorry, but I'm happy no. to stay on if there's questions. That was fantastic. It was really very informative. I enjoyed it. Uh, there are a few questions. Sure. Uh, let's see. First one was. Okay, never mind. You answered the question. Okay, that was one of them. Um, let me start from the beginning. Would a person who has been diagnosed with mesial uh, sclerosis as the cause of epilepsy benefit from genetic testing? I think potentially. Um, I think I think that's a good conversation to have with your physician about um, what the understanding causes for the epilepsy, and if there's still some questions about what the true diagnosis is or how that came to that diagnosis and if, um, if a further workup would be um, helpful. 
Okay. Um, now this one, Mitchell said that you answered it, yeah. but do insurance okay. companies pay for the genetic testing, especially when doing uh, the trio-based analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, like I said, there are insurances that are, we about 70% of commercial insurances now have medical policy written in um, to their policies um, that cover whole exome. Again, it's hard to always say a blanket statement. Yes, insurances cover it. I think every individual plan is different. Um, if you're going to do this testing, uh, we do at GeneDx offer something called a benefit investigation, which we can look into your insurance um, plan to see what the estimated out-of-pocket cost is. So I think it's good to um, understand what your own personal insurance coverage is. And if the laboratory going to do testing with has kind of those abilities to look into what the cost may be prior to, you can do it even prior to getting the testing done. That can be helpful to know what the cost would be for your, your specific situation. Okay. Um, after discussion with our neurologist at, at CHOP, we decided to do epilepsy genetic testing on their daughter. Uh, we had a gene DX test done in 2021 and they got the results in 2022. Mm -hmm. And they did go over the results without with their neurologist, but they're wondering if it's possible to have a conversation with a gene DX representative to get your interpretation on the report. Uh, they're feeling that there could be a lot more information speaking with uh, a representative from Gene DX. I think um, I think that's a great question, and I we love to partner with local genetic counselors. We're never here to replace um, any of genetic counseling services. I think maybe um, first starting to have a conversation with your your initial provider and genetic counselor who order that testing to let them know that maybe you have still follow up questions, um, but. Again, we are happy to speak with you if you feel like you are needing additional review or would like more information um, and, and you feel like that you could be uh, that could be beneficial. So our genetic counseling services do require a referral from a provider to um, to us to have that conversation. Um, it's at you know um, no additional cost for for most insurances to have that conversation with us. Um, but it does require a referral um, form to be filled out so we can have that conversation with you. Um, do you recommend, I, and I believe you did cover this, a rec, mm -hmm. um, an adult that has had genetic testing 20 years ago to request an updating? And Yes, so 20 years ago, that's, um, testing was very, very different. I would definitely um, speak with, uh, your current neurologist or provider you feel comfortable with and letting them know you had genetic testing in the past. Um, but like I said, genetic testing has changed so fast. What we did even five years ago is very different than what we did do today. So it's definitely worth having that conversation with your provider. Okay. Are there certain types of epilepsy that don't show up on results for genetic testing? Oh, good question. Um, I would say one that, that, that's a hard question because we're continuing to learn more and more about the genetic influences of epilepsy. So it's hard to have a blanket. Um, we definitely know these types of epilepsies do not show up on genetic results or um, don't definitively have a genetic cause. I would say definitely the one uh, epilepsies that may be more due to trauma infection, um, those kinds of reasons for epilepsy. As I mentioned before, we, we kind of know more of the ones that are more likely to show up at this point, which um, I called out before in the lecture. Um, but none that I can think off at the top of my head. Okay, uh, can you explain autosomal Recessive. recessive? Sure, I definitely can. Autosomal recessive inheritance. So as I mentioned, um, that is a type of inheritance where um, typically mom and dad are, are carriers of a condition. That means they have a gene change that's not affecting them. But when they pass on that gene to their child and um, that gene change 
Uh, you get one from your mom and one from the dad. It's kind of like the combination of the two gene changes together can cause the condition. So in every gene we have, we typically have two copies of that gene. One we get from mom and one we get from dad. So when a person's a carrier, one gene's working perfectly fine and one may have a variation um, that prevents the gene from uh, not working properly. But since you have that one that's working okay, you don't have any signs or symptoms. But if, again, a child inherits um, the gene from dad that has the gene change and the gene change for a mom, the, they have no working copies of that gene. And so then they show the symptoms. I hope that's helpful. I think so. Yeah, okay. um, you have many compliments thanking you and saying how much they learned. And I personally, have really learned a lot. Anyone that I know that does not have a cause for their epilepsy, I'm going to tell them to get, because I hadn't realized how it affects the, um, the treatment when you said mm -hmm. certain things that they should avoid or shouldn't have, or who's good on the keto diet, mm -hmm. who it works for. So, um, so there's, sometimes uh, it just, it's just knowing, you know, and yeah. then also if there is something in the family, having other family members tested, you want to have more children in the future what's the chance for this to happen again or um you know there's there's or if you know you have a pregnant sister you know all the different you know family mm -hmm. member implications as well so um i'm glad to hear that you, you found it helpful mary and and others oh, did as well everybody's an excellent presentation great job and we all agree and i thank you for your time and your knowledge and i thank everyone for tuning in tonight to learn more, uh, please stay connected with us on our websites on uh, genedx.com or efepa.org. Um, if there's anything else that you need or or want, just let either of us know. And thank you, thank once you again. so much. Thank you. thank you for the invitation. It was um, my pleasure to be here tonight. Okay. Take care, everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.